Okay. So thank you, Stephen, for your your, your nice uh, your nice introduction. Uh, I'm not full professor yet. I'm associate professor at the University of Parma, but I'll 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 pass your your advice to the University of Parma administration. Uh, I think it's a very good idea, actually. So yes, the title must of that's the title of my talk. So I would like to speak uh, about recent advances on stability convergence and variable resolution in SPH. Uh, so just to give you um, a rough idea of uh, how, how SPH evolved in the last uh, years, you can see that um, on your on your left uh, um, there are a pic there is a picture from uh, Cameron and Ben's paper in 1991. They were simulating <clears throat> two uh, planets that were colliding, and the same simulation done a few years ago using the Swift code is reproduced on, on your left. As you can see, uh, first of all, the number of particles people are using for the same problem has increased a lot because now people are using uh, 100 million particles to simulate uh, this, this collision. And also the level of details and the quality of the simulation is clearly totally different. If we move to <clears throat> something close, closer to my, to my expertise, which are free surface flows, we can see more or less the same, the same kind of advance. Because uh, if, we, if we look at the first pre-surface flow simulated by Joe Monaghan in 1994, it uh, was, was able to simulate it with a few hundred particles. Whereas if we look at the simulation done by Canela et al, where the fluid is interacting with rocks, which are also interacting with each other uh, via a DM, uh, a DM um, Scheme, you see that uh, the, the quality of the simulation and the level of complexity of uh, applications that we are we are simulating now is is much much better. So <clears throat> I think in these days it's clear that SPH is a, is a is a is a numerical method that is able to simulate free surface flows, also very complicated ones. And it's also used uh, with success for different uh, ap industrial applications where complex boundaries uh, and, or, and or complex interfaces are, are present. Despite this, uh, at least in my opinion, it is also clear that SPH still requires important developments uh, to be adopted by academia and industry and, and further research and in particular for the fundamental research is required. And for this reason, the um, spheric community and, and the spheric, spheric is the international organization uh, dedicated to the SPA schemes has identified uh, five different grand challenges. So the, the five different grand challenges are uh, Mm, convergence, consistency, and stability, boundary conditions, adaptivity, coupling with other models, and applicability, applicability to industry. And if you want to know <clears throat> uh, more things about those five grand challenges, uh, you, can, you can read the paper we published a couple of years ago about this on computational particle mechanics. Uh, I've, I've, uh, I asked Stephen to speak for three or four hours in order to cover all five grand challenges, but he told me that this was not possible. So, uh, and he told me that I have only 50 minutes. And so I'm, I'll be able only to cover grand challenge number one, which is convergence, consistency, and stability. But really the question I'm trying to answer today is the following one. So is SPH uh, inherently affected by low accuracy or poor convergence rate? Uh, and, and the second grand challenge I'll, I'll, be, I'll be trying to address is adaptivity. Uh, and so, and, and, or if you, if you prefer, we'll, I'll try to answer the question, the following question, is SPH restricted by uniform resolution? But, but before getting to that, uh, before, before getting into that, um, mm, let me uh, start from uh, the basics of SPH and apologize if uh, 
this uh, type of information is a bit too uh, basic for some of you, but in any case, uh, as, we, as we know, SPH is uh, affected by two different sources of error, and this is, um, it, it, um, and this makes SPH quite different from uh, other classical numerical schemes, such as finite volume, finite difference, on, or finite element. The first uh, source of error is the so-called smoothing error, and this appears one in this integral here. Uh, the delta Dirac function is substituted by the so-called smoothing kernel uh, W. And in order to reduce uh, the smoothing error, what we have to do is to uh, send H, and H here is the so-called smoothing length, so is the, the quantity that defines how big is your kernel size, which we have to send H to zero. And then there is another error, and the other error appears when you are uh, discretizing the integral with uh, a summation. So basically, you move from the continuous space to the discrete one, and so you are introducing your computational points in your domain, which we call particles. And in order to reduce this discretization error, what we have to do is to send n, so the and n uh, is the number of neighbors of a certain particle, we have to send it to infinity. Okay, but n is proportional to h over dx to the power of d, and d is the number of dimensions in your problem. So if you are in 3D, d is three. So basically, uh, in order to reduce the smoothing error, h has to go to zero. In order to reduce uh, the discretization error, <clears throat> and as those has to go to infinity. How do we keep those two things together? But basically, h has to go to zero faster than uh, the, 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 the way n goes to infinity. Okay, the other, the other uh, property of SPH that makes it quite different from other uh, numerical schemes is the fact that uh, we adopt, in SPH, we adopt a Lagrangian description of motion, meaning that uh, the computational nodes or particles are moving with their own velocity. And also the fact that it's meshless. So those points or particles have no topological, topological connection between, between, uh, between them. Uh, and finally, to make things even more complicated, there is no partition of unity, or in other words, it means that you don't know where your mass is, uh, or where the mass associated to a certain computational nodes or particle is, is located in your, in your domain. So, uh, in SPH, uh, there is a, in my opinion, there is a dichotomy. And, and, and the dichotomy is between the Lagrangian description of motion, so particles moving accordingly to their velocity, and the, the property we want to, the, the, the accuracy of the SPA scheme. So we want the scheme to converge as fast as possible, but we want also to preserve the Lagrangian description of motion. But the problem is that if we are Lagrangian, we can't, con we can't control uh, the particle position. I apologize, Steve. Can you tell me if you are still uh, hearing me or, or not? Uh, yes, your presentation is working fine. Um, Zoom has paused you for the moment. Yes, so, Zoom yeah. has paused me, but you can hear my voice. Yes. Yeah. So shall I keep going or, or, or not? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but by all means, turn your video stream off if it will increase your bandwidth. Okay, so... What I was saying, okay, the, the problem is uh, between like being Lagrangian and being being accurate, and so how do we, how 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 the Lagrangian uh, approach is affecting the accuracy? Well, if you want to answer this question, uh, you you have to look at the uh, very nice paper published by Nathan Quillan in two thousand and and six, where he did this analysis. <clears throat> Basically, okay, this plot is a bit complicated, so give me, give, please give me a minute to explain it to you. Uh, this is a convergence analysis. Uh, there is no numerical scheme behind this. This is just an SPH interpolation 
of the gradient of uh, the function a. The function a is defined here. And so basically what they, they did, they um, did this convergence analysis uh, for different level of uh, particle disorder. So sigma here is defining the, uh, the particle disorder. So if you look at the line where particles were arranged on a Cartesian grid, so no disorder, you see that uh, the, the, the convergence rate is the one that you were expecting. So second order convergence rate, second, uh, second order convergence. But when you are introducing a little bit of uh, disorder in your particle distribution, then this is no longer the case. Actually, what you are getting is that when you are reducing your smoothing length, uh, so you are refining your domain, you are converging, 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 but up to a certain point, uh, you're no longer converging and you are, what you are getting is actually you are diverging. So it means that the error is increasing while you are uh, increasing your uh, computational loads. And this is, uh, due to the fact that your particles are uh, not uh, very well uh, distributed in your domain. There is, a, a part, there is an isotropy in your particle distribution. Okay, so the first thing that uh, comes to, to, to mind when you are dealing with that is that probably it's a good idea to <clears throat> Uh, abandon your, the Lagrangian description of, of motion, which is done by integrating those equations, and go to an Eulerian description of motion, uh, still using SPH for, um, for discretizing the differential operators that you have in, uh, in, your, in, your, in your equations. The equation I'm showing here, obviously, are the, the Navier-Stokes equation written in weakly compressible form. I'm not, I don't have time to explain to you what I mean with that. I hope you are familiar with this uh, approach, which is uh, the most popular one for SPH schemes. So when you are Eulerian, basically what happens? Well, it, it happens that the particles are no longer moving. So basically you're not changing the position in time and you are introducing both in the continuity and in the momentum equation, you are introducing the so-called advection terms. As, as simple as that. Okay, so basically we pay the price to be to be Eulerian and we see, uh, and we see what we can get out of our uh, SPH uh, spatial interpolator operators. Uh, so, so if, for example, we put particles on a Cartesian grid and we use a fourth order Gaussian kernel, then we can see that uh, the, the, the convergence rate we can achieve is exactly uh, the expected one. So basically, we are converging as with, uh, with um, a convergence rate of, of, of four. So basically, if we are Eulerian, then we can have spatial interpolation that is as accurate as desired. So it's not, it's not true that SPH is uh, affected by a poor convergence rate, uh, but this is, ma is mainly due to the fact that we are uh, moving particles with the Lagrangian, uh, Lagrangian uh, velocity. And so we can control the uh, quality of the particle distribution. So if, okay, if we stay Eulerian, uh, we, 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 we can be as accurate as we want. So basically we decided to see what we can do uh, with an SPH Eulerian model uh, for simulating turbulence. Well, as you all know, turbulence is, uh, a complicated subject. So what we did is to try to <coughs> obtain DNS uh, simulations using an Eulerian SPA scheme. If we look a little bit at the literature, we can see that uh, turbulence in SPH has been already addressed by a few author. Uh, let me just mention the most uh, popular papers. The first one was done by Malangan in, in uh, 2009. He uh, developed uh, a Lagrangian uh, LA-NS uh, scheme called Epsilon-SPH. 
And then there is the work of uh, Bulow and Lisa with uh, uh, RANS model written in SPH form. And then in terms of LES schemes, uh, there is the work of Darlene Pollen in 2006, and also the more recent one done by Dimash and et al. in 2017. And finally, <clears throat> going to DNS uh, simulations, uh, okay, the, the, the literature, there is not much, but uh, they were done by Arno Meyer et al. in 2015. So we try to do uh, a DNS scheme uh, with an SPH Aurelian uh, approach. The kernel we adopted is the so called uh, Wineland C6 kernel, which is this one, and, but we corrected it in order to increase the accuracy, at least at continuous level of our scheme. So Basically, uh, we, we did that by correcting the kernel so that uh, we can be fourth or sixth order accurate, at least uh, at continuous level before, before getting into the error generated by uh, the discretization done with the particles. Obviously, you can see here in, in the plot that the kernels that are fourth and sixth order accurate have a region where they are becoming negative. Oops. What happened? Hello? Hello, we can still see. So we're on Taylor Green okay, Vortex okay. 3D around 1600. Okay, so and we so we we developed that model, and the first and um, test case we simulated was a Taylor Green vortex in 3D with for a renal number equal to uh, 1,600. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a very famous test case for DNS simulations, and it's uh, basically you are starting from a flow that is. Uh, laminar, and then the flow becomes uh, turbulence, and you are get, you are simulating an, a decaying isotropic turbulence in your triple periodic box. Uh, well, okay, there is no analytical solution for this test case, but uh, there are a lot of high fidelity data available in literature. Uh, so initial conditions and the reference data are taken from one release et al. 2015. Uh, so the, the same the same problem was simulated with an Eulerian uh, an Eulerian scheme. To give you a rough idea of what we are expecting, uh, if the movie is working, I hope it is. If not. Nothing's happening at the moment. No, no, uh, you will get there. Okay, can you see it? Steve, can not, you see? Not it? right now, no, it's still on the okay. same okay, uh, never, never uh, Telegram vortex. Never mind. Okay, so I apologize, but the movie was just uh, a, a, a qualitative, nice, but qualitative results uh, obtained with our scheme in terms of verticity, magnitude, and cool criteria. Um, okay, we simulated it with uh, the, so the Wenland uh, C6 kernel, uh, second order, fourth order, and sixth order accurate version of the same kernel. The other thing I wanted to mention here that is that when you, you are using the sixth order kernel, you have to increase the ratio between age and the particle space in order to keep your numerical scheme stable. Uh, and the viscous stress model we, we, we were using is the standard one for SPH, so Lo and Chao 2002, which is uh, described by this equation here. In terms of uh, decaying of kinetic, kinetic energy, you see here the results we obtained with the, the second, fourth, and sixth order accurate kernel. Uh, okay, so for three different uh, resolutions. <laughs> Excuse me, Renato. I don't. I don't think the slides have moved on. So we're still seeing the Taylor Green Vortex 3D slide. Ah, that's a pity. I don't know why this is happening, though. 
Uh, okay, give me give me a second, uh, student. Sorry. Uh, uh, what do you see now? Still the same. Sorry. Still the same. So it's still Taylor Green Vortex 3D. Okay. So let me stop sharing. Share it again. <laughs> How about now? Uh, yeah, so yeah, so if you just move to presenter mode, then I think um, it's refreshed itself. Yeah. Do you see it now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, this is the movie I was trying to, to show you before. Yeah. We can clearly see that the vortices are becoming smaller and smaller until they are destroyed by, by the viscosity model, as it should happen in this test case. Okay, so this, I already said that when you are increasing your age over the X uh, ratio, uh, so when you are using your sixth order model, you have to increase your age over the X ratio in order to keep your, your scheme stable, but that is due to the fact that the sixth order kernel has a larger region where it, 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 it becomes negative. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is that we, we're using, uh, we were discretizing the viscous stress using low and Shao 2002. In terms of uh, decaying of kinetic energy, here you see the results we obtained with three different level of resolutions. And with the second, fourth and sixth order kernel, it's clear that, uh, at least it's clear to me that the sixth order kernel produces better, slightly better results, particularly uh, for larger times, uh, <clears throat> for the level of resolutions that are uh, bigger, so uh, and things are clearer if instead of looking at the energy itself, we look, we look at the energy dissipation rate. Uh, okay, uh, the, the, the continuous dark line is the reference solution, and you see that the sixth order kernel is uh, producing results that are more accurate than the second order one. So this uh, was expected somehow, but it was nice to see that also in SPH, uh, you're not just converging uh, theoretically, but your, your sixth order um, scheme is actually more accurate. Uh, also, when you are trying to simulate uh, turbulence, then your second order one. And if you look at the vorticity contours um, in one slice of your domain, you can see that uh, high order uh, schemes, fourth and sixth order, are the only ones that are able to reproduce. Uh, the same type of the same type of vorticity uh, uh, that uh, varies at all were obtaining, whereas the second order um, approach is not. Uh, whereas if we look at the turbulent energy spectra, <clears throat> again we see that first of all we are able to reproduce the reference solution. And for larger wave numbers, the high order schemes are getting better results than the low order one, than the second order one. So uh, there is no free lunch, as you know, at least in, in CFD. So uh, what are we paying for our um, high order schemes? Well, uh, so everything is normalized to the cost of the second order scheme with the coarser resolution. And so you can see that basically the fourth order scheme is only 20, 25% more expensive than the second order one. And this is due only to the fact that the can we are using is uh, more computationally expensive to compute in terms of number of floating point operations that you have to produce. Whereas when we are getting to the sixth order kernel due to the fact that we have to increase the number of neighbors by, by increasing the age over the X ratio, then the cost becomes uh, larger and, and is well, between two and 2.3 times more expensive than the second order one. Although I have to say that this comparison is not completely fair because 
what you should do when you are investigating high order schemes is to uh, evaluate the cost of your simulation do done with the low order and high order scheme for a, a given level of error. But this is very difficult to obtain uh, if you are simulating turbulence. Okay, so the take home message here is that basically uh, these particles are distributed in a regular way. Uh, arbitrarily accurate SPH spatial operators can be adopted. And that uh, also, we can also say that Euler SPH schemes can produce DNS simulations of similar accuracy of other Eulerian methods. But we still haven't stored the so called uh, dichotomy between, between accuracy and Lagrangian description of motion. And this is uh, what I'll try to, to address uh, from now. So first of all, the question just, we should ask ourselves. You're at 25 minutes, roughly. Just to okay, the, thank you, thank you. So the question we should ask ourselves is the following. Is SPH Lagrangian? Well, everyone is, is telling that SPH is Lagrangian, so it should be true. But when you look at the literature, you see that even starting from the very first uh, SPA scheme proposed by Monaghan for free surface flows in 1994, this, uh, th there was a correction here instead of the question mark. He added something. And basically, every group that he is working on SPH at some point has proposed a correction for the pure Lagrangian uh, motion of particles. So, is SPH Lagrangian? Me, I would say that SPH is almost Lagrangian, but no one is, is actually using an SPA scheme, which is uh, completely Lagrangian. One, well, the most popular correction, instead of this question mark, the most popular correction introduced in, uh, in SPA schemes is so -called, the so-called uh, Fichian shifting. And the Fichian shifting was, was proposed in, uh, in Manchester. There are two papers. One is Linda Tan published in, uh, uh, 2012 on JCP, and then a following another one done by Skill and et al. Uh, one year later, also on JCP. And I have to say that uh, the second one has just uh, won the third edition of the Monaghan Prize at the Spheric Workshop in Catania uh, a couple of weeks ago. And these two guys, which are Professor Benedict Rogers and uh, Dr. Lind, were, were very happy to receive <coughs> to receive this um, prestigious prize. So how, how this uh, pitch and shifting works? Well, basically, the correction yes here is proportional to uh, the gradient of C. And the gradient of C <coughs> is uh, the particle concentration. So basically, you are correcting the particle position uh, by a quantity that is proportional to the particle concentration. And the particle concentration is obviously computed using this very simple um, SPH summation. <clears throat> I apologize. So mathematically speaking, this uh, particle concentration can be also seen as the approximation of the gradient of one. And so basically, by simply rewriting it like that. So basically, we are moving particles, or we are correcting the particle position in a way that it should uh, achieve a better accuracy for the gradient of uh, a constant function. That is the, the key idea behind this uh, fiction shifting approach. But there are issues related to the fiction shifting. The first issue is that the formulation is explicit. So there is no guarantee that the gradient of C is small. And we are correcting the Lagrangian trajectories. And so this uh, introduces an error in your, in your scheme. For the second issue, different uh, ideas have been suggested. One is to correct the physical quantities 
after shifting. Or another approach is to introduce abduction terms in your in your continuity and momentum equations. But so the second issue is, is more or less can be solved. We still have to fix the first issue. And, in, and so the idea we had to, to solve the first issue is to introduce the iterative or super shifting as Professor Peter Stansby uh, called it when uh, the first time I was, I was showing it to him. Uh, and so how, how this uh, iterative or super shifting works? Well, there is an explicit version of it, which very briefly uh, is, is, is summarized here. So the main idea is that you don't shift every time step, you shift only when the maximum gradient of uh, the maximum grad C in your set of particles is larger than a certain value that you have defined which is the, the threshold for uh, grad C. And then when this condition is, is achieved, you activate your iterative shifting and you keep uh, doing it over all particles in your domain several times until uh, the maximum gradient of C is larger than the 10% of the threshold. By doing that, you are obtaining, or we were able to obtain very nice results because basically, even if we remove the hypothesis of being Eulerian or of, of having particles arranged on a Cartesian grid, we were able to achieve uh, the same theoretical accuracy we achieved before by being Eulerian. For example, in this, uh, Approach here, we were using a fourth order Gaussian kernel, and we were able to reproduce the, the theoretical fourth order convergence rate. The issue or the problem related to the explicit iterative particle shifting is the fact that it is very, very expensive, and the computational cost uh, increases a lot when you are increasing the number of particles in your domain. And so we change it. It uh, by, by making it, uh, instead of being explicit, we made it implicit. And this work, I have to say, has been done in collaboration with uh, Andri Zaidro. And the, the student who did this is uh, Pietro Lastelli, who just obtained his PhD at the University of Parma uh, a few months ago. So now I have to show you a few, a few questions, but please, uh, try to follow what I'm saying, because it's not too complicated. Uh, so we start very from a very uh, simple formulation um, by writing the Taylor series expansion of a generic function, uh, generic scalar function f. And we can write it like that, where basically x uh, with the hat is uh, the <clears throat> are the coordinates of our particle after shifting, uh, and whereas x without hat is are the particle coordinates before shifting. Okay. Then, if we say, okay, uh, this generic function f, you know what? I'll I'll call I'll, I'll uh, define f as the gradient or the derivative of the particle concentration c. So I take f this way. And so if I substitute this f into the Taylor series expansion and I neglect <coughs> nonlinear terms, so this part of the equation, I'll, I'll end up with this equation here, which where our shifting, which is what we actually want to calculate, is uh, in, in the red box. I'll, I'll, I, I just copied the previous equation in the new slide. And then now we focus on this term here and we try to find a way to approximate this. Please note that so far there is no SPH, okay? This is just a, a Taylor series expansion at particle height. So, 
this summation here, the term where j is equal to one, for example, can be rewritten like that. And please note that in this, so can be rewritten like that by uh, adopting an SPH discretization of the uh, gradient of the particle concentration at particle one. So basically this is approximated with this summation here. And then if uh, I do, uh, I, I explicitly write every time of this summation. I notice just that just the first one is not is not is not zero, whereas the other ones are exactly zero. So I end up with this. If I do the same thing for j equal to two in this summation here, I end up with this term here by doing basically the same the same approach. And so if I take these two terms and I put them back in our Taylor series expansion and end up with something like that, with, uh, which I can rewrite, uh, which I can rewrite it uh, in a more compact way. In this, uh, with this um, notation here. Okay. Obviously, here what I did, I I I, I forgot to say that I impose that the gradient of C at particle one at the new particle position x hat is equal to zero. So if this is equal to zero and I'm imposing it because I want to find the new position of the particles. So the x hat array that is guaranteeing that the gradient <coughs> of the particle concentration is zero. And so I'll end up with this one. And then if I write everything for every particle I have in my domain, I'll end up with uh, uh, n equations where n is the number of particles in your domain. <clears throat> and so basically what I, what I do is, uh, what I'm doing is building a linear system where this is matrix A, this is the vector of unknowns, and this is B. And so by solving this, I am able to obtain uh, the shifting quantity for every particle from one to n, which guarantees that the gradient of the particle concentration at every particle is zero. Okay, this is 1D, okay? This, but this can be extended and we have extended also to 2D or 3D. Uh, it's quite, quite simple. All you have to do is to repeat the same thing for every coordinate you have in your, in your system or in your domain, sorry. So if, for example, in 2D, you have to repeat it with coordinate X and Y, and you have to take into account uh, also cross derivatives, okay? So what you get is, uh, again, a linear system also in 2D, uh, where your matrix is sparse, and the size of the matrix is D, where D is the number of dimensions. <clears throat> so in 2D is two, in 3D is three. Uh, that is the size of your matrix. And the non-zero terms are D times N times NV, where NV is the number of neighbors you have for each, uh, for each particle. Okay, so we basically repeated the same approach we were using for the explicit shifting. So uh, basically we solved this linear system several times. <clears throat> Uh, until we reached uh, the maximum number of iterations. This is equivalent uh, to solving the problem of gradient of C equal to zero for each particle adopting a neutron Raphson iteration approach. And every loop here is a, a neutron Raphson loop. And so <clears throat> we did it by starting from a random particle distribution and, do and doing many, many iterations and see how the grad C and uh, the norm of a certain test function is evolving. And the results were quite nice. As you can see from this plot, the, uh, in, in four or five uh, neutral Raphson iterations, we were able to reach the minimum value of the L2 norm of the gradient of C, which is one, two, three, four, three, four order of magnitude smaller 
than the initial one. Please note that we started from a pseudo random particle distribution, but particles at the end of uh, the, at the end of the iterations were rearranging themselves in hexagon in an, in an hexagonal centered finite configuration. Uh, okay, uh, same thing for the gradient of our uh, scar function half in two, three neutral option iterations, we were achieving the same level of error we were obtaining by adopting a Cartesian grid. And that was true for different level of resolutions, meaning that this approach uh, is independent, at least the, num the number of iterations you have to do is independent to the um, <clears throat> resolution you are adopting. So if you do a convergence analysis for different age over uh, delta here, which is uh, the particle size uh, values, you see that you are able to obtain the same type of convergence rate that you are getting <clears throat> in SPH when you are using um, a Cartesian particle, uh, a Cartesian grid for the particle distribution. And this is, uh, this implicit iterative particle shifting is far more efficient than the explicit one. Okay, uh, then. In about 40 minutes. Later. Okay, so I think I won't be able to cover the adaptivity part, uh, but uh, I think this is quite interesting. So, mm. okay, so implicit iterative particle shifting, we did it, we plugged what I was just showing to you in, a, in an actual, um, <clears throat> scheme where the particles are actually moved according to some equations. We are not solving the Navier-Stokes equation yet. We are just updating the particle position according to some uh, predefined uh, motion, which is the same motion. Uh, th this type of motion is the one from the Taylor Green to the uh, equations. And what do we get? Well, in terms of past particle, um, Concentration, this is where, what we were getting from the explicit non-iterative uh, fixture shifting. So you can see that the error in terms of grad C is quite large. Whereas if you are adopting your, if you are adopting the implicit iterative shifting for two different uh, level of thresholds, because beta here, beta here is controlling uh, the maximum error you are allowing in your domain, you can see that the, the implicit iterative Shifting was able to keep the <clears throat> error uh, in terms of grad C uh, below the pre assigned threshold. And this is clear also from this plot, where the L2 norm of grad C is shown. You see that if uh, with the implicit iterative shifting, we were able to, to keep the grad C maximum value of grad C under control, whereas with the fiction shifting, we were not. Okay, but then the question is how much does it cost in terms of uh, computations? Well, not much. Uh, in comparison with the fiction shifting model, the, the implicit iterative shifting was, I don't know, uh, 10, 15, uh, 10, 15 percent more expensive if uh, beta was equal to 10 and it was. 70% more expensive if we were more ambitious in terms of the maximum error we were allowing in our, in our domain. Okay, but if you want to use this into an actual numerical schemes for naive Stokes equations, you have to also guarantee that you are updating your physical quantities after the implicit shifting. A little bit what I was explaining uh, to you at the beginning when I started talking about shifting. And so we proposed two different approach to do that. One is the so-called advection correction. Uh, basically we freeze our uh, physical um, model, which is an ILE uh, SPA scheme in this case. And then we do an advection correction to update the physical quantities at the new particle position. And the second approach is more classical. Basically, we do an I order moving least squaring calculation uh, to transfer the physical quantities from the old particle distribution to the new one. 
Okay, those are the equations for the Lyachin corrections. Uh, and this is the idea of the um, moving least second order moving least square uh, reinterpolation from the original particle distribution to the updated one. So if we compare the error now, now we are simulating a 2D tailored in vortex uh, viscous one for rain not equal to 100, and we are actually solving it uh, using a full SPH ALE scheme. Uh, so if we look at the error in, in the velocity field we are getting for the explicit shifting, this is the maximum value. If we don't do any update of the physical quantities after the implicit iterative particle shifting, then we are achieving an error that is one order of magnitude smaller than the one we are getting with explicit shifting. But if we go to the uh, MLS2, corrections for the physical quantities or the one obtained with the um, advection corrections, you see that the error is reducing quite substantially again. And this is also confirmed by this plot where we are doing a convergence analysis of the velocity error with the different schemes I was, I was explaining to you. You see that, but first of all, when you get when you are going from explicit to implicit, you are improving the, both the error and the convergence rate of your scheme. And then when you are introducing the two corrections, you are getting, uh, uh, you are still improving the, the, the level of convergence of your, of your scheme. Okay, moving to another test case. Uh, now I'll show you the 2D moving box, which is also the spheric benchmark test case number six. I hope people are familiar with that. Uh, so here, those two movies are showing the grad C uh, with the explicit shifting and with the implicit iterative particle shifting. It's clear that the implicit iterative particle shifting is able to reduce the grad C substantially in your domain. And this is also confirmed when you are looking at the velocity uh, field, <clears throat> which is, uh, well, there is a reference solution for this, which you can download on the, on the Spheric website, and which I also have uh, reproduced here. You see that uh, basically by, by introducing the IIPS approach, we were able to obtain a velocity field which is very similar to the reference one. Again, if we check again the computational cost for these second applications, we can see that, yes, uh, the IIPS uh, is more expensive than the explicit shifting, but, but not, uh, not, not substantially. We are adding something between, uh, I don't know, 70 maximum or a little bit less percent to the computational cost of uh, your, your numerical scheme. This is another, and this is the final test case I wanted to show to you, uh, which is the 2D impinging a jet. And again, uh, again the, those movies are, are showing the gradient of the particle concentration, uh, which is, uh, well, those results are confirming the same results I uh, was obtaining for the other test cases. So implicit iterative particle shifting is able to improve the quality of the particle distribution uh, significantly. And this is also confirmed when you are looking at the physical quantities, for example, pressure. Here, the comment I have is that the, the pressure field <clears throat> generated by the advection correction is noisier than the one we were getting using the implicit iterative particle shifting with the moving least square, uh, I order moving least square reinterpolation. And my guess, but this is something that we still need to investigate, my guess is related to the fact that here we have to improve the way we are updating the particle position close to the boundaries. Okay, for this test, test case, there is also an analytical solution for the pressure. At the, at the boundary, so at the uh, pressure at the plate. And this confirms that the implicit iterative particle shifting is able to produce more accurate results also 
in terms of pressure uh, at, at, the, at the plate. Okay, I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. I'll skip everything I wanted to say about uh, adaptivity. And uh, let me just uh, finishing uh, saying thank you very much to all the, the people that uh, were collaborating with me uh, on, on, on those, those subjects. I'm not going to mention all of them because there are too many names, but you can see the names and the pictures in this. We have a few few minutes. Um, so the, the first uh, was uh, from Paul, uh, Paul Gronenboom, uh, and he asked, I mean, it's in the chat, but I'll read it out just for the um, just for the record. Uh, how do we maintain advantages of SPH for free surface flow and moving interfaces when using Eulerian or particle shifting? Uh, that, is a, that is a very good question. I think I think uh, so. <clears throat> uh, I think the, the short answer to this question is that we can't obviously. If we say that we are Eulerian, then we are losing all the advantages of, of being Lagrangian. And, uh, and one of the largest or advantages of being Lagrangian is related to the fact that you can describe interfaces of, or free surfaces evolution uh, without adding uh, any other special treatment. Uh, and that is one of the key points for being Lagrangian. I guess the point of, of going Eulerian for a while was trying to show to people that um, when we say that, or when people are saying that SPH has problems in terms of convergence rate, in terms of accuracy, this is not related to the fact that you are using SPH as a spatial interpolation approach, but it's more related to the fact that you are being Lagrangian and so, by being Lagrangian, you are basically uh, changing the, 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 or you are reducing the quality of, of your particle distribution a lot. And this has an impact on your convergence rate or on your accuracy. And so that was more like my starting point. And then I said, okay, if I am Eulerian, I can achieve whatever order of convergence I want by, by my SPH operator. Now let's try to remove this assumption of being Eulerian and see if I can preserve the same quality by going back to an Lagrangian approach, but where the particle distribution is, is uh, controlled by particle shifting. Is that more or less an answer or not? I don't know. I think so. Yeah. I mean, uh, any, any sort of major improvement to the method is, is unlikely to be able to be introduced without somehow affecting the usability and applicability. I think that's that's usually the case, isn't it? Um, so I guess it's about introducing these things and then somehow bringing back the usability whilst maintaining the benefits. Okay, uh, so uh, we then have a question from uh, Parikshit uh, Barrett Gowder. And it says, uh, I've often observed the noise and pressure with and without particle shifting. So such as on your last slide, what are your <clears> thoughts <throat> for this behavior in SPH? Okay, so there are different sources of uh, errors in, in SPH schemes, and all of them are affecting your pressure field. So first source of error is related, well, first source of noise in your SPA scheme is related to the fact that you are weakly compressible, okay? If you are, obviously. So, because there are also SPA schemes that are strictly compressible, but most popular ones are adopting a weakly compressible approach. And so in the weakly compressible schemes, you do have pressure waves that are traveling in your domain, and that is generating noise at a given frequency. And then, the second source of error <clears throat> that is also generating noise in the pressure field is the so-called particle resettlement. Okay, when you are integrating the the SPH equations, uh, at some points particles are 
even if you are not using shifting, okay? Particles are able to destroy the Lagrange, the pure Lagrangian uh, trajectories by an error that you are uh, introducing in your momentum equation. And this generates uh, additional noise in your, in, your, in your scheme. And so it's complicated because the noise is coming from this, in the noise in your pressure field is coming from different sources. And in order to remove it, you have to be able to remove all different sources. Particle shifting is able to prevent up to a certain point the noise generated at, uh, at the highest frequencies, which is the one due to the so-called particle assessment. So if you simulate the dumb rate, you see that, and you start from a Cartesian particle distribution, you say that you see that particles are, are remaining in, in columns and rows up to a certain point, and then this uh, particle distribution is destroyed and they are rearranging themselves in a pseudo-random uh, way. And when this is happening, this is, generated a lot of, this is generating a lot of noise in your pressure field. And this is the error that the particle shifting is able to, to prevent. That, at least that is my opinion. Thank you. Uh, so the next is from uh, Mashi Green. And uh, he was wondering if you tried to get a similar level of accuracy in the higher order scheme by reducing the number of particles and comparing computational time. Hi, Mashi. No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, when you say, Reducing the number of particles, I guess you mean using a coarser resolution, am I right? Yes. <laughs> okay. No, I haven't, but that is what we should do. So Mashi is suggesting what I was trying to explain during during my presentation, basically. So you 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 fix your error at a certain level, and then you 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 try to achieve that error with the low order model and the high order one. And then you compare the computational time for a given level of error for the low order and the high order model. This is what we, we should do actually, but it's very difficult to do that for uh, if you are simulating turbulence and so you don't have a, you don't have an analytical solution because you do you have to do it basically by trial and error, and that means a lot of simulations. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, so probably the last question, given the time. Uh, so Tom DeVoice uh, has asked, uh, the gradient of C is non-zero near the free surface. How does that affect particle shifting near the surface? Okay, so so yes, uh, thank you, Tom, for, for your question. Yes, so the, the, the way we were able to treat the particle, um, the, so the free surfaces by, by in, in the simulation where I was using implicit uh, iterative particle shifting, was simply uh, tracking uh, by an SPH interpolations. We were we 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 tracked the particles that they were that were at the free surface, and for those particles, we say zero shifting. We we froze those particles. Okay, so there is no shifting for particles that were at the free surface because uh, I mean. At the free surface, the gradient of C is clearly large, and there is no way you can you can adjust that. It's something you have to accept. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, if you want, I can reply to the Mashi's last Mashi's question. So I don't know. Yeah. Sure. So uh, Mashi asked to follow on. Uh, what about shifting only in the tangential uh, direction? Uh, it 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 doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I tried it, we tried, uh, but the problem is that when you are getting to the iterative shifting, it doesn't, it, even if you are explicit and you just shift at the tangential direction and neglecting the, uh, the, the shifting in the normal direction, then you are getting a uh, very strange particle distribution and you're not, you're not improving the quality of your particle distribution on the free surface. Okay, thanks very much. So I think the, the questions are sort of coming to an end and obviously we, we've roughly reached the end of our time as well. Um, so, I mean, the, the 
really just remains for me to say thank you very much uh, for, for giving this talk, Renata. Uh, obviously, these are really thank important you. topics. Thank you to you. Uh,